You're, you're all very studious. I really like that. Good evening. How is everyone tonight? Thank you so much for being here. My name is Denise Lucy. I'm professor and director of the Institute for Leadership Studies here at Dominican University. And I, know, I think I know all of you here. You've come before, haven't you? How many have come before? See? Didn't I tell you? And so, again, raise those who have not been here before. Why? <laughs> we are so thrilled to have you here tonight. And our program is a partnership with Book Passage. And I think we should applaud them for that. <laughs> because they have been in our town and in the city for over 45 years bringing remarkable thinkers and writers to our neighborhood. And it's just a joy. And as I was telling Elaine and Bill earlier tonight, they have really put our Institute for Leadership Studies on the map. Our Institute for Leadership Studies here at Dominican University, it's a center for engagement of our students and our community. We offer leadership training and development curricularly inside of academic degree programs and also for organizations that want to have better teams and work more effectively as a great constructive culture. And we're so thrilled to be offered the chance to partner with Book Passage that has given us such remarkable, remarkable visibility. Because they brought over 155 tremendous world-class writers and thinkers to Dominican's campus over 19 years. So let's thank them for partnering with us to find that right match. And tonight, isn't this a perfect match? It is indeed. So what I'd like to do is also thank uh, our, our sponsors, because without them, we can't support the project. So we'd like to thank our diamond sponsor for tonight's lecture, Christine Christensen. What, don't we love her? Raise your hand, Christine. Raise that hand. Christine Christensen of Engel and Volkers, who has represented Marin Luxury Real Estate for over 20 years, is, is a member of the Marin Platinum Group of county's top 100 real estate agents. She is, not only is she fantastic in that regard, she's an alumna. She, came to, she graduated with her MBA here at Dominican University and a founding member of our Women Leadership Philanthropy Council. So thank you so much, Christine, for what you've done. And also, our, our, our other sponsor is Women Leadership Philanthropy Council. What is that? That's a long word, right? Long name? Joy Phoenix, what does that mean? We're a great group of women who do great things. We're a, we're a giving circle, and, and uh, thank you so much, Joy, for being a founding member and our membership chair. Talk to her. We want to have you join us. About 50% of our members are Dominican staff, faculty, and alumni. The other half are community members that join us. And we, we give our membership dues to a big pot that we then spend on women's leadership development. And fun sometimes together, isn't that true? So Women Leadership Philanthropy Council members, raise your hands. Yes, thank you so much for your support. It is my honor to introduce Allison Dana Howard. Allison is the Department Chair of Political Science, International Studies, and History at Dominican University. She has been a member of the Institute for Leadership Board for over 15 years at Dominican, and she's a terrific teacher, partner, and scholar. She has taught courses in American institutions, including the Presidency, the Congress, politics and media, campaigns, and elections. Her research focuses on presidential rhetoric, specifically the State of the Union, and uh, unilateral elect executive actions as well as part of uh, politics, art, and culture. She has published articles and noteworthy publications including the American Behavioral Science, the Journal of Political Science Education, the Social Science Quarterly, and she's co-authored a book addressing the State of the Union called the evolution and impact of the president's big speech. And again, she serves on a, uh, the Institute's board, and I'm so proud that she brought students with her tonight. Thank you, political science majors. And please welcome Allison Howard, who will introduce our guest. Thank you, Allison. Yes. 
Hello, and thank you. I am thrilled to welcome back to Dominican our highly anticipated speaker for tonight, David Brooks. As an instructor who teaches courses on American institutions, I often have incorporated David Brooks's columns into my courses. Reading his articles helps students connect the abstract theories and concepts covered in political science to policy debates that are currently taking place or in many cases should be taking place. The insights Mr. Brooks shares about what he believes has worked well in the past and the present and what hasn't inspires thought-provoking discussions about what's possible for the future. Most importantly, he reminds all of us of the importance of discussing and debating differing views about policy issues to find constructive, collaborative solutions for current and future problems. Tonight, Mr. Brooks discusses his latest book, How to Know a Person, a practical, heartfelt guide to the art of truly knowing another person in order to foster deeper connections at home, at work, and throughout our lives. How to Know a Person helps readers become more understanding and considerate toward others, and to experience the joy that comes from being seen. This book also offers a possible remedy for a society that is riven by fragmentation, hostility, and misperception. David Brooks is one of our nation's leading writers and commentators. He's an op-ed columnist for the New York Times, a writer for The Atlantic, and appears regularly on PBS NewsHour, which he mentioned to me backstage that the Bay Area has the largest followership and viewership for PBS NewsHour. Yes. So that is probably why we are sold out tonight. He is the number one New York Times best-selling author of The Second Mountain and The Road to Character, as well as the author of The Social Animal, Bobos in Paradise, and On Paradise Drive. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce David Brooks. Please join me in welcoming him to our stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out tonight. This is, uh, every four years, one of the, my favorite events uh, that I do on my book tour. There's somehow the energy, Mar Marin is supposed to be so low key, but the energy in these rooms is always so fantastic. So I'm always thrilled to be here. Um, thank you, Dominican. Thank you, Book Passage, a really fantastic bookstore, one of the best in the country. So you're lucky to have it, keep it going. Um, and thank you for being Northern Californians. I, I, uh, I did an event in Los Angeles earlier in the week, and it was lightly drizzling. And people had bought a book, bought a ticket, and like 30% didn't show up. <laughs> lightly drizzling. <laughs> so thank you for, for coming out. Uh, now, uh, you may have uh, seen and remembered this movie, Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, and if you did, you, you know how huggy and warm and emotional Jewish families can be always singing and laughing and dancing. I come from the other kind of Jewish family. And so the phrase in our culture was, think Yiddish, act British. And so super stiff upper lip, no emotion. When I was uh, four, my, parent, my nursery school teacher apparently told my parents, David doesn't really play with the other kids, he just sort of watches them. Uh, which was good for a career in journalism. I always tell journalism students, if you're at a football game doing the wave and you don't do the wave, you just sit there, you have the right kind of aloof personality type to be a good journalist, because that's <laughs> what we do. And then when I was seven, I read a book called Paddington the Bear, uh, and I decided at that moment I want to become a writer, which again is a somewhat solitary, removed profession. Uh, in high school, I wanted to date this woman named Bernice, and she didn't want to date me, she wanted to date some other guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. And so, <laughs> Uh, those were my values. Um, and then when I was 18, the admissions officers at Columbia, Wesleyan, and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago, uh, which is a, a very also cerebral, extremely cerebral school. The famous saying about Chicago, where fun goes to die. Um, my favorite saying about it, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, 
And so I fit right in. I had a double major in history and celibacy while I was at Chicago. Um, and we, we, I fit right in. We, we, my, me and my freshman roommate um, entered the, the boxing competition, the Golden Gloves. And he had never boxed a day in his life. And, but we just gave him a nickname, the Kosher Killer. Uh, and, and then we, um, we trained the Chicago way. We didn't actually practice boxing. We just read a lot of books about boxing. Um, and his illustrious career uh, lasted 29 seconds. Um, and so I, I was living up in my head. Uh, and when I got a job in journalism, again, it was somewhat cerebral. I, I was hired as a conservative columnist at the New York Times 20 years ago, a job I likened to being the chief rabbi in Mecca. Uh, not a lot of company there. And then, and then I got a job in TV. Um, but I got a job in the most cerebral program on television, the PBS NewsHour, and thank you for your applause before. And we have a great audience, um, and, but they're, they're seasoned. Um, <laughs> um, and so if a 93-year-old lady comes up to me in the airport, I know what she's going to say. I don't watch your program, but my mother loves it. Uh, so, um, and so all this is kind of intellectual. And my way of living is symbolized for me or from something that happened to me um, probably about 15 years ago. I'm a big baseball fan. I've been to hundreds of games. I've never got a foul ball. But I'm sitting in Baltimore with my youngest son, and the batter loses control of a bat. It flies in the stands. It lands on my lap. Now, getting a bat is a 1,000 times better than getting a ball. And any normal human being stands up, jumps up and down, hugs everybody, high fives, gets on the jumbotron. I put the bat on the ground and stood there like, just stared straight ahead. <laughs> I had uh, the emotional reaction of a turtle, basically. Um, and I eventually decided that if you cut yourself off in this way from emotion and from intimacy and connection, you're cutting yourself off from life itself and the best things in life, which is connection with other human beings. So I decided I was going to um, become just a better human being, more human, more emotional, like get introduced to what feelings are. Uh, and so I decided to do it the, the, the cerebral way. I, I wrote a book about emotions. Um, <laughs> it was called The Social Animal. Uh, and then I, I wanted to develop character, so I wrote a book about character. And I learned that writing a book on character doesn't actually give you good character. Even reading, reading a book on character doesn't give you good character, but buying a book on character does give you good character. So I recommend that. Um, and it sort of worked. Uh, I've, I'm a different person than I was 10 years ago. I think I'm more emotional, I'm more available, and I can prove it, but I have to do some name dropping. Uh, I've been interviewed by Oprah twice in my life. Yep. Okay. Um, down in Santa Barbara. And uh, after the second interview, which was in 2019, she says to me, David, I've rarely seen somebody change so much. You were so emotionally blocked before. And so that was a good day for me. I mean, she's Oprah, she should know, right? Uh, and so that was a, a trip toward being human. And as I'm taking a trip toward being human, unfortunately and tragically, America is taking a trip to becoming more dehumanized. And so uh, you probably know all the statistics, rising mental health problems, 30% rise in suicide, 60% for teenagers, 36% uh, of Americans report feeling lonely most of the time, 45% of teenagers report being hopeless or despondent most of the time. The number of Americans who say they have no close personal friends has gone up by fourfold since 2000. The number of Americans who rate themselves in the lowest happiness category is up by 50%. And when you're sad, when you feel invisible and alone, there's nothing crueler than to feel, make somebody feel like they don't exist, you don't see them. And when people feel that way, they regard it as an injustice, which it is, and so they lash out. And so sadness leads to meanness. And so with all those sad statistics, I could write, recite a whole bunch of mean statistics, hate crimes, gun violence, mass killings. Even in everyday sense, I, uh, spoke to a restaurant owner in New York who said he has to kick somebody out of his restaurant every week now for entitled and rude behavior, which he never used to have to do. And so we've become just a sadder, meaner society, and you only need to look at our politics to see that. 
And so a bunch of people tell a lot of stories about why this has happened. And I agree with all of them. There's the social media story. Social media is driving us all crazy. There's the sociology story. We're less active in our communities. There's the economy story. We're more unequal and therefore living dissimilar lives. I tell the moral formation story that we haven't been trained to be as moral and as considerate to each other as we should be. And some of that is just learning basic skills, how to be a good listener, how to end conversations gracefully, how to reveal vulnerability at an appropriate pace, how to sit with someone who's suffering, how to host a dinner party to make everybody feel included. I'm not sure we're ever great at this, at teaching these skills, but we live in an incredibly diverse society and our social skills are inadequate to the society. And the paramount social skill to becoming a decent human being is the ability to see others, understand what's going on in their head, and make them feel seen, heard, and understood. And so I ask you, how good are you at this? Now I come here every four years, I think this is my fourth trip to Dominican, um, and I don't know a lot of you well, but I can tell you with great confidence you're not as good as you think you are. <laughs> the average person, according to University of Texas research, when you meet somebody, the average person understands what's going on in the other person's head accurately 20% of the time. Some people are 50%, they're really pretty good. Some people are 0% who think they're 100%. <laughs> they're clueless. Uh, so in any group of people, there are diminishers and there are illuminators. Diminishers are not curious about you. They make you feel small and unseen. Often I leave a party and I think, you know, that whole time nobody asked me a question. And I've come to uh, conclude that about 30% of the people you meet are question askers. And the rest are perfectly nice people, they just don't ask questions. Uh, and so they're diminishers. Illuminators have a persistent curiosity about other people. They practice the skill that make people feel seen and appreciated. So there was a novelist who lived about 100 odd years ago named Ian e. Foster. And his biographer wrote of him, to speak to him was to be seduced by an inverse charisma, a sense of being listened to with such intensity that you had to be your most honest, sharpest, and best self. It'd be great to be able to listen with that intensity. There's a story that's told about Jenny Jerome, who would later go on to become Winston Churchill's mom. But when she was a young woman in Victorian England, she happened to be one night seated at a table, at a dinner table next to William Gladstone, the prime minister. And she left that dinner thinking that she was, that William Gladstone was the cleverest person in England. Then a couple weeks later, by coincidence, she's seated next to Gladstone's great political rival, Benjamin Disraeli. And she leave, leaves dinner with Disraeli thinking that she's the cleverest person in England. <laughs> and so it's good to be Gladstone, it's better to be Disraeli. <laughs> Bell Labs is a famous research facility and years ago, they were trying to figure out why some of the researchers were way more productive and creative and innovative than some of the others. They checked out their education background, their IQ, they couldn't figure out why. And then they realized the most creative researchers were in the habit of having breakfast or lunch with an electrical engineer named Harry Nyquist. And Nyquist would ask them about their challenges, get inside their heads, and help them think through their problems. So Harry Nyquist was an illuminator. And so how do you become an illuminator? Well, for students, my first bit of advice, major in the humanities, you read a lot of novels and biographies, because the liberal arts teach you about people. And if you don't know about people, you'll be miserable, and you'll make other people miserable. <laughs> then there's a process of, that I'm gonna now go through a few stages of how do you really get to know someone. And the first step in this process is the process, is the first gaze, when you first meet someone. When you first meet someone, Everyone is asking an un unconsciously a question. Am I a priority for this person? Am I a person of this person? And the answers to those questions will be expressed by your eyes before any words come out of your mouth. And so I was at a, din a diner in Waco, Texas several years ago, and I was having breakfast with a woman named LaRue Dorsey. And Mrs. Dorsey um, had been a teacher much of her career, and she presented herself to me as a stern disciplinary drill sergeant type, and I was a little intimidated by her. She said, I love my students enough to discipline them. And so I'm sitting there like, very, oh, this lady's pretty formidable. Uh, and into the diner walks a guy, a mutual friend of ours named Jimmy Durrell. 
and Jimmy's a pastor, uh, and he walks up to our table, uh, and he grabs Mrs. Dorsey by the shoulders, and he shakes her way harder than you should shake a 93-year-old. <laughs> and he says to her, Mrs. Dorsey, Mrs. Dorsey, you're the best, you're the best, I love you, I love you. And that stern disciplinarian, in a second, turns into a bright, eye-shining nine-year-old girl. And that's the power of attention. He had just been some appreciation at her, and she was transformed. And part of it is because Jimmy has just this warm personality. But part of it is that he's a pastor, uh, and when Jimmy sees someone, anybody, he sees someone made in the image of God. He's looking into the face of God. He's looking at somebody with a soul of infinite value and dignity. He's looking at somebody so important that Jesus was willing to die for that person. And you can be Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, agnostic, don't care. But seeing each person you meet with that level of reverence and respect is an absolute precondition for seeing them well. So that's the first attitude. Attention is a moral act. Second is the process called accompaniment. Most of the time we're not like having deep conversations and staring into each other's eyes. Most of the time we're just busy doing something. Picking up our kids in school, shopping, at a meeting. Attention is an other-centered way of being, just everyday life. And so think of the way a, music, a pianist accompanies a singer. The singer is the star, the pianist is just there to make her shine. And it's just a generous way of living. And sometimes accompaniment is patient. I have, a, I have friends in DC who say, we like our friends to be lingerable. <laughs> the kind of people you just want to linger with after dinner. You're letting the relationship develop. The second process of accompaniment, and a great way to get to know people, is just play, any form of play. Whether it's tennis, or uno, or poker, or pickleball, God forbid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and when my, my uh, oldest son was um, about 12 months, he used to wake up at 4 a.m. every morning, uh, and he would, um, we would play until I went to work at about 10 a.m. And so we did a lot of playing. I was trying to nap the whole time, but he was laying. <laughs> and I remember once at about that age, I thought to him, you know, I know this human being better than I've ever known a person. And he probably knows me better than anybody's ever known me because I'm so open with my kid playing. And we had never exchanged a word because he couldn't yet talk. And yet you can get that kind of communication in play. And then there's the art of presence. Sometimes you just show up for people and you make them feel seen just because you showed up. And so I had a student at Yale. I only teach at schools I couldn't have gotten into. Uh, and, <laughs> And she, her name was Jillian Sawyer. She was a graduate student. And while she was in college, her dad died of pancreatic cancer. And they discussed as he was dying that he would not get to see the big occasions of her life, like her wedding. Uh, and after college, um, she was a bridesmaid at a friend's wedding. And she's the bridesmaid, and she watches the father give a toast to his daughter. And then it comes time at the reception for the father-daughter dance. And she decides that, I just can't take this a little too soon. And so she heads to the ladies' room to have a cry. Uh, and when she comes out of the ladies' room, she sees uh, everybody at her table in the adjoining table just waiting in the hallway. And she let me quote from her paper that she describes what happened next. What I will always remember is that no one said a word. Each person, including the newer boyfriends who I knew less well, gave me a reaffirming hug and headed back to their table. No one lingered or awkwardly tried to validate my grief. They were there for me for just a moment, and it was exactly what I needed. And that's just the art of presence. So that's accompaniment as a second phase. The third phase is conversation. I called the book, had, had a, the subtitle of Seeing Others and Being Deeply Seen, but it really should be Hearing Others and Being Deeply Heard. Because I can't imagine what's going on in your head. I have to ask you. So how good are you at conversation? Again, probably not as good as you think you are. <laughs> now, I live in DC, the emotional avoidance capital of the earth. <laughs> um, and a lot of people in DC are bad at conversation. I, I was calling a friend. He was serving in the White House at the time. And he, we were having a talk about some issue. 
uh, and he's telling me about the issue, and I'm on my cell phone, and the call drops. So I wait two minutes, thinking he'll call me back. Then I wait three, four, five. Finally, after 10 minutes, I call his office, and, I, and the, his assistant says to me, uh, he can't talk to you, he's on the phone. And I say, no, he's on the phone with me. He's, he's been bloviating for 10 minutes, and he doesn't know I'm not there. Um, uh, <laughs> so that's, that's a bad conversation. <laughs> And so I asked all these, these conversation experts, how do I get better? And they gave me a bunch of tips, which I threw in the book, and I'll just mention a few of them. One is treat attention as an on-off switch, not a dimmer. If you're gonna be present with somebody, make it 100% or zero, but not 60%. Second, be a loud listener. I have a buddy named Andy Crouch, and when you talk to him, it's like talking to a Pentecostal church. He's like, yes, yes, amen, amen, preach that, preach that. Love talking to that guy. Um, make them authors, not witnesses. When people tell you a story, they don't go into enough detail. So if you ask them, where was your boss sitting when she said that, then they're really narrating the scene and you're getting them into, and suddenly you're getting them to really tell you what's going on in their life. Don't fear the pause. If we're having a conversation and my conversational comment starts at my shoulder and goes to my fingertips, at what point have you stopped listening so you can think of what to say? Probably here. So let me, if it's an important thing, let me talk to my fingertips and then pause and then respond. Don't be a topper. If you tell me you're having problems with your teenage son, my instinct is to say, I know exactly what you're going through. I'm having a problem with my Tommy. It sounds like I'm trying to relate, but really what I'm saying is, enough about you. Let's talk about me. <laughs> so don't be a topper. Keep the gem statement at the center. If we're having a disagreement, there's probably something we actually agree about. If my brother and I are fighting over our dad's health care, we may disagree about that, but we both want what's best for our dad. So if we keep coming to that thing we agree upon, the gem statement, then we've preserved our relationship in the midst of disagreement. And then the final one I'll mention is uh, find the disagreement under the disagreement. If we're disagreeing even about a hot topic like the Middle East, why do we see the situation so differently? And so then we're not fighting, we're like on a joint exploration. What's the, what's the really philosophical or experiential reason we're disagreeing? Suddenly we're not at each other's throats, we're on a joint exploration. And another way to preserve the relationship. Finally, the quality of your conversation depends on the quality of your questions. And so being a great question answer is, asker is just tremendously important. Now, kids are phenomenal question askers. I have a friend named Naomi Wei who teaches seventh grade boys English. And she was teaching them how to ask questions, how to be an interviewer, like how to be a journalist. And she said, okay, I'm gonna sit here in the front of the room, ask me anything you want, I'll answer it honestly. So the first question was, are you married? She said, no. The second question from another boy was, are you divorced? She says, yes. Third question, do you still love him? It's like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and she says, yes. Fourth question, does he know? Does her kids know? The kids were like hammering in there. So those are great question askers, kids. Now, adults can be good questions askers, but they have to start with open-ended questions. And so open questions are just like, tell me about, tell me about. Uh, and so there was a woman who was, I read about in a book called You're Not Listening by Kate Murphy, and she, a focus group leader, had been hired to, um, uh, by grocery stores to figure out why people go to the grocery store late at night. And she could have said to the focus group, why do, you, why do people go to the grocery store late at night? Instead, she asked an open question. Tell me about the last time you went to the grocery store late at night. And one woman who hadn't said anything in the whole focus group said, well, I'd smoked a joint, and I needed a menage a trois with me, Ben and Jerry. And, uh, so, that's a good question. <laughs> Once you get to know someone, you can ask questions that are like 30,000 feet questions that really get people out of their daily rut and get them to see themselves from a new way. So uh, if the next five years are a chapter in your life, what's the chapter about? Gets a good conversation going. 
uh, if you died tonight, what would you regret not doing? What would you do if you weren't afraid? I had a friend who, asked, who was being interviewed for a job. He, after the interview, he turned to the woman who was interviewing him and said, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And she started crying because she wouldn't be doing HR at that company if she wasn't afraid to leave. <laughs> I asked my students at Yale, and every year a couple say, you know, I wouldn't be at Yale. It's not quite the right school for me, but I need the prestige. And so fear plays a role in our lives. Peter Block is a writer who writes about community. He has great questions, but you really have to know the people well to ask. What's the commitment you've made you no longer believe in? What's the gift you currently hold in exile? What talent do you have you're not using? What's the no or refusal you keep postponing? And so that you really get into somebody. And so that being a great question asker is the fourth stage. And so far I've just been talking about asking questions and being with people in normal circumstances. In crueler times, like the times we live in, in more dehumanized times, you have to get good at some of the hard conversations. And so I'll just quickly mention two hard con time, kinds of conversations. The first is when you're, some, you're talking to someone who's really down or depressed. Now, my oldest friend in the world was a guy named Peter Marx, uh, and he had a wonderful life, 57 years, a surgeon, great wife, great family. And then out of the blue, at age 57, he got hit by just severe depression. And I didn't know, uh, I thought I was a well-educated person, but I didn't really know what depression was. And I learned you can't understand depression if you're lucky enough, never been hit by it, by just extrapolating for your, from your moments of sadness. Another friend of mine, a guy named Mike Gerson, said that depression is a malfunction of the instrument we use to determine reality. So Mike, like my friend Peter, had these uh, lying voices in his head, telling him lies about reality. They're lies like, no one would miss you if you're gone. You're not worth anything. And the voices are just repeating in his head. And so I encountered my friend and I didn't know what, what to say. I lacked the skill to really sit with someone who was going through this. And early on I made mistakes that a lot of, the kind of mistakes that a lot of people make. And they're mistakes like, first, I tried to give him ideas of how to get out of depression. And like I said, he used to do these service trips to Vietnam. He found it so rewarding. Why don't you do that? And I learned later that giving a press person ideas about how to make a lift is just saying, just proving that you don't get it. Because it's not ideas they're lacking. It's energy and so much else. The second thing I did was try to remind him all that was good about his life. You have a great family. You have great kids. You have a great career. You love your job. And if you do that, all you're doing is reminding the person that they're not enjoying the things that are palpably enjoyable. And so that's another mistake that people made and that I made. What I learned later on is the only thing you can do with depression, the first thing you can do is acknowledge the reality of the situation. This just sucks. Uh, and then the second thing you can do, I learned from a Baptist friend of mine, a pastor, is just say, I want more for you. I want more for you. The words won't solve anything, but they'll show your good intent. I want, I care about you. I want more for you. Viktor Frankl wrote this great book, Man's Search for Meaning, from the death camps, the Nazi death camps. And when he was confronting with people who were contemplating suicide, he would say something that sounds sort of harsh to my ears, but apparently was effective. Life has not stopped expect, expecting things of you. You still have some jobs here to do. I give them a sense of responsibility. And people who have been through this kind of suffering uh, have a credibility. There's a great Thornton Wilder quote I like. Without your wound, where would your power be? It is your very remorse that makes your low voice tremble in the hearts of men. The very angels themselves cannot persuade the wretched and blundering children on earth, as can one human being broken on the wheel of living. In love's service, only the wounded soldiers can serve. And so here's your power. Use your power. The second kind of hard conversation is across disagreement. People come to me with critique, they think I'm part of the establishment. We, we, we face disagreement across ideological lines, ethnic lines, all sorts of lines of economic inequality. And when somebody comes up to me with that kind of critique, my, I want to get defensive and say, hey, I'm one of the good guys. But I've learned that the right thing to do is just try to stand in their standpoint. It's to ask them three or four different times to go deeper into their point of view. Tell me what I'm missing here. Explain that to me again. Go deeper on that. 
and I may not persuade them and they may, may not persuade me, but at least by showing curiosity, I'm showing some respect. And, in, and there's a book, great book I recommend called Crucial Conversations. Uh, and the authors say, in every conversation, respect is like air. When it's present, nobody notices. I mean, when it's present, nobody notices, but when it's absent, it's all anybody can think about. So it's that act of showing respect and that act of paying attention to the under conversation. In any conversation, there's what we nor nominally are talking about, but the real conversation is the flow of emotions between us. With every comment, I'm either making you feel more safe, less safe, more respected, less respected. So pay attention to that under conversation. There's a phrase, every epistemology becomes an ethic. The shape of our knowledge becomes the shape of our living. The relation of the knower to the gnomes known becomes the relationship of the living self to the larger world. That's Parker Palmer, an educator. And what he's saying is the way we know another people is the way we are in the world. It becomes an ethic. It becomes a way of being, a moral way of being in the world. And being an illuminator is a moral ideal. And so I often ask people, tell me about a time when you, somebody really got you. Uh, and with shining eyes, they tell me these stories. And some of the stories are very mundane. They're not grandiose. It's like a, a, a guy told me about his little, his little girl was, um, was struggling in second grade. And the teacher said to her one day, you know, you're really good at thinking before you speak. And that one comment turned the girl's ear around because it took what she thought was her weakness, so, so social awkwardness, turned it into a strength. And he was telling that, like, when I ask people, tell me about the time you've seen, the number one category of people people mention are teachers. Great teachers can see potential in a student. And I remember a time I was in 11th grade, I made some smart ass comment in English class. And Mrs. Dewsnap said to me, David, you're trying to get by on glibness, stop it. And I was humiliated in front of the whole class. But on the other hand, I thought, wow, she really knows me. I'm so honored. <laughs> <laughs> one, little, one woman who was in her 30s told me about the story of the time she was 13, where uh, a, um, she went out and had her first taste of alcohol came home so drunk, she lay down on the front porch and couldn't move. And her dad, who's a big, strict guy, comes up and uh, he, she thinks he's gonna scream at me the things I'm already thinking in my head. I'm bad, I'm bad. Instead, he just scoops her up, carries her inside, lays her on the sofa, and says to her, there'll be no punishment here. You've had an experience. <laughs> and year, decades later, she remembers that moment as the time he understood he didn't need to scream at her. And so some of the moments are more profound. Uh, I'll, re I'll read you one from a, a movie that I hope you all know, Goodwill Hunting. And in that movie, Matt Damon's this math whiz and Robin Williams is his therapist. And Matt Damon eviscerates Robin Williams by making fun of a painting he painted. And Williams carries him out, to, uh, calls him out to a pond the next day. And he says to him, you're a tough kid. I ask you about war. You probably throw Shakespeare at me, right? Once more into the breach, dear friends, but you've never been near one. You've never held your friend's lap and watched him breathe his last breath. You ask me about love, you probably quote me a sonnet, but you've never looked at a woman and been totally vulnerable, known someone who could level you with her eyes. I look at you, I don't see an intelligent, confident man. I see a scared, cocky kid. You're a genius, well, no one denies that. I don't care about any of that because you know what? I can't learn anything from you that I can't read in some book. Unless you want to talk about you, who you are. Then I'm fascinated, I'm in. But you don't want to do that, kid. Do your sport because you're terrified of what you might say. Now that speech flows, which I haven't performed as well as Robin Williams, um, <laughs> that flows from great listening. Because the therapist has heard the thing that the, Robin Williams, that the Matt Damon character is trying above all to hide which that he's terrified. And the Robin Williams character lays this fact on the table and um, says, it's okay, I care about you. The second thing I love about that speech is the Robin Williams character is describing two ways of knowing. There's the kind of knowledge you get from a book and then there's the kind of wisdom you earn from being vulnerable in life. There's a great Montaigne quote, you can be knowledgeable with other men's knowledge but you can't be wise with other men's wisdom. You have to earn it yourself. 
And he's saying, this is what you lack, experience of life. And the end of the movie, well, I won't give it away. But, <laughs> but to me, who spent so much time learning stuff from books, believe me, folks at Books Passage, I believe in books. <laughs> but I believe in life as much. And he's saying, you got to live. There was another passage I read. This was in a memoir called Lost and Found by a woman named Catherine Schultz. And Schultz had this dad named Isaac who sounds like just a wonderful guy. He was, had opinions about everything, infield fly rule in baseball, whether opera, apple cobbler is better than apple crisp. Uh, and uh, at, so, but at the end of his life, um, he just went mute. He stopped talking. Nobody could figure out. The doctors didn't know why. And then the last day, he's in the hospital or in the hospice or something, and he's just sitting in the room, and the family decides they're going to go around the room and say the things they didn't want to leave unsaid. And Schultz describes the scene. My father, mute but seemingly alert, looked from one face to the next as we spoke, his brown eyes shining with tears. I had always hated to see him cry and seldom did, but for once I was grateful. It gave me hope for what may have been the last time in his life and perhaps the most important, he understood. If nothing else, he knew that everywhere he looked that evening, he found himself where he'd always been, with his family, the center of the circle, the source and subject of our abiding love. So that was a guy who died well seen. And so if it's great to feel seen, I can tell you it's also great to be the seer. One day, about maybe a year or two ago, I was at my dining room uh, reading a boring book, which is what I get paid to do. Uh, and I look up, and my wife walks in the front door, which you can see from our dining room table. And she stands in the doorway, and it's summer, and the sun is coming in behind her. She's sort of silhouette by sunlight. And she just pauses there for a minute, and she doesn't notice that I'm there, because that's the kind of charisma I have. <laughs> um, uh, and she looks at a, an orchid. She, her eyes rest on an orchid that happens to be sitting on the table we keep by the front door. And I had a sensation sweep across my consciousness. I know her. I really know her. I know her through and through. And if you'd asked me what I knew about her, I wouldn't have, it wasn't any collection of facts about her. It wasn't her personality traits. It was sort of the whole flow of her being the incandescence of her personality, the undercurrent of insecurities, the rare flashes of anger. I wasn't seeing pieces of her or having specific memories about her. It was like I was seeing the whole of her, the harmony and flows of her music. And if, it was almost as if I wasn't seeing her, I was seeing out from her. And to really see someone, you have to know how they see the world. And if you had asked me to describe how I was looking at her at that moment, I wouldn't have said, that. well, I wasn't observing her. I wasn't inspecting her. The only word in the English language I can think of is beholding. I was just beholding her. And it was a delicious sensation. It was really great. And I told somebody of this story a few weeks later, and they had grandkids, and they said, yeah, that's what we do to our grandkids. We just behold them. And it's, it's just great. And so we live in a brutal age. Uh, the dates of our century speak to a brutalism that we've all been enduring, September 11th, January 6th, October 7th. Um, and it's easy to feel brutalized by it. But in my view, it's a, the only decent response is a, a defiant humanism. To say it's not naive to lead with curiosity, it's not naive to lead with respect, that if you trust other people and lead with trust most of the time, they will trust you back and they will be better versions of themselves. And so democracy is not just about voting. It's about human encounter. It's about compromise, conversation, humans trying to figure stuff out across difference. And you can't have a healthy democracy when society underneath is rotting. And so this book and the skills it describes and the stuff I learned while writing it are a small attempt to fight back against the creeping dehumanization of our times and to make us all a little more human. Thanks.
David, you are so inspiring. Oh, well, thank Just you. Lift us up. Well, you're, you're lucky. I'm a natural question asker, and I've always thought that I myself live with myself 24-7. <laughs> That's something that when I can encounter you, you're different. I know who I am, but I don't know about you. And this audience is really inquisitive. So let's dig in. Um, to what do you owe and attribute your insatiable energy and curiosity? Because, damn, you have a lot of it. <laughs> well, um, one of the things is I'm a newspaper columnist. And so I have to write a column, uh, or I write an article every day. And so um, I used to have normal human needs, um, like food, water, sex. Uh, now I just have a need for column ideas. Uh, and the favorite saying that columnists tell each other is that um, uh, being a columnist is like being married to a nymphomaniac. It seems good for the first two weeks and then it's just exhausting. Um, and so I, part of it is just, I, I, the good part about being a columnist, it keeps me fresh. Yeah. It keeps me like, okay, what am I gonna learn today so I can teach somebody else? And I, I, my, one of my favorite saying of, uh, about writers is that we're beggars who tell other beggars where we found bread. Mm. And so when I find something that nourishes me, I just like to share it. And that's like my supreme joy in the world, frankly. Nice. You have always had a philosophical bent, as long as I've been reading you and hearing you on NPR. Does that come from something in your childhood? Yeah, I, well, my parents were academics, so uh, that was the family business. Uh, and um, you know, I, I think, a little of it was my, uh, frankly, I was very much well raised by my grandfather, who was an immigrant. And he was a great writer. There's a saying that it takes three generations to make a career. And I go back to my grandfather, pr frankly. And I find that not unusual about that. I, I often used to ask my students, tell me about the person who made the biggest difference in your life. And grandparents came in number one. And I certainly felt that, and for those of you who are grandparents, I see somebody of the appropriate age. Um, I do think some of that, but then my parents were, you know, somewhat intellectual, and I should say since we're in, we're in County, they were pretty significantly to the left. Uh, and uh, I, when I was five, they took me, this was like 19, late 1960s, and they took me to a B in where hippies would go just to be. <laughs> Um, and I was five, and, and they, one of the things the hippies did was they set a garbage can on fire and they threw their wallets into it to demonstrate how little they cared about money and material things. And so I'm five years old, I see a five dollar bill on fire. I <laughs> break from the crowd, I reach for the money, and I ran away. And that was my first step over to the right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what is your definition of kindness? Oh, that's good. Um, Audience. Well, I think kindness is not knowing what would make you feel comfortable, but knowing what would make the other people, person feel comfortable. Uh, and so there's a, a book, uh, there's a guy, Rabbi Elliot Kuklo, who tells a story about a woman who has a brain injury, and so just sometimes unaccountably, she just falls to the floor. And she told him that when people see me fall on the floor, they rush to pick me up because they, they're so uncomfortable seeing an adult on the floor. And she says, what I really need at that moment is somebody to get on the ground with me. And so I think that's kindness, is being willing to get on the ground with somebody. I like that. Um, we, it's very good. Um, we heard on NPR that Japan has a minister of loneliness. Do you think we'll get one in the United States? Uh, yeah. And if so, where would they start? Would they start in Georgia, in the Bay Area, in New York City? Where would the most work need to be done? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, the, Britain also has a Minister for Loneliness. Uh, this is a global phenomenon. Um, I, I would say we almost sort of have one right now, which is the Surgeon General Vivek Murthy who's been really, he had to deal with some little COVID thing for a little while, but, um, but he really has dedicated his, a lot of his term as Surgeon General to loneliness because he knows there are few things uh, that are greater killers than loneliness. And that it, increase in heart attacks, cancers, it really destroys death expectancy 
uh, when you're lonely. Because we, you know, babies come out of the womb looking for uh, a person to see. I don't know if anybody's, if you go on YouTube, there are these things called still face experiments where they, uh, a mom is instructed, when the baby makes a bid for attention, the mom is instructed not to respond, just still face. And if you look at the, the baby's fuss for like 10 seconds, then they get more unhappy, and within 30 seconds, they're in agony. Uh, and I don't think us humans are very different, that we all need attention, we need, some, we need recognition, the primary human need. And so, Murthy is trying to address this, and a, a lot of us are trying to address this problem. As to where um, it would, you would locate where we would start, um, I, I find it weirdly everywhere. Uh, and it seems independent of social class. I think it's probably worse for young people. One of the things, the most disturbing statistic that I face uh, and I worry about is Two generations ago, if you asked Americans, do you trust your neighbors, people right around you, 60% of Americans said, yeah, trust my neighbors. Now it's down to 30%, and 19% of millennial and Gen Z. The younger you go, the more distrustful people are. And those of us who are older, we're still reasonably trusting. But imagine what it's like to go through life thinking that everybody's out to get you. It's just a horrible way to live. Uh, and I ask my students, why? Why is there so much distrust? And sometimes they talk about the really disillusioning things they've had to live through. But so, you know, one woman said, you know, I've had four boyfriends and they all ghosted me. They didn't have a conversation and say, this isn't working out, they just vanished. And so she assumes that boyfriend number five will ghost her too. And so that they just walk through with a high level of distrust in part because having had the conversation, you don't just ghost somebody. You say, this is, I'm, I'm sorry, this is not working out for X, Y, and reason. And at least you're being decent about it. And, but I don't think they haven't been taught how to form a romantic relationship. Their studies show guys in particular just suck at flirting. Um, I, I'll be at a bar, um, I was at a bar about a year ago in DC having a drink alone, which uh, you would call it sad guy having a drink alone. Um, I would call it reporting. And, and there's a guy at the bar next to me, a couple, clearly their first date, and he's bloviating on and on and on. She looks, she's so bored out of her mind, it looks like she wants to spontaneously combust. <laughs> and I want to take a fork and just drive it in the guy's neck and say, ask her a question, dude. But he didn't know, he just didn't know. So I think young people are, are hardest hit by this thing. I think we should all get out on our front porches more. When I grew up, people were out on the front lawn or in the street, all the kids around. I mean, we, so many people don't even know any of the neighbors on their block. Is that a common thing for you? There's just like you don't know your neighbors. Yeah. It's a really I, I start, in 2017, I started up a little nonprofit called Weave the Social Fabric Project. And it was to celebrate people who were like that, who were like the person in their neighborhood who like created community. And so I met all these weavers, and one of them said, I practice aggressive friendship. <laughs> I'm like, I'm the one asking. And so they, you know, a woman in, in Wilkes, North Carolina, said, you know, when I go to the Walmart, it takes me 45 minutes to get out of there, because I know so many people. And so I look down the aisle to see if I can scoot in before anybody recognizes me. <laughs> and then, apropos of what you were just saying, I would go around the country on this weave, a weaver project, and I would ask, I would, say, you know, the problem is we don't know each, we don't know our immediate neighbors. And I said this in New Orleans at one point, and they looked at me quizzically, and they're like, what are you talking about? We all know our neighbors. And so there are some places where that still exists. And so the weavers were these wonderfully inspiring people who are building that kind of relationship wherever they go. Uh, and, you know, I asked one lady, we ran to one lady in Florida who, um, she was helping elementary school kids cross the street after school. And we said to her, do you have time to volunteer in your community? And she said, no, I don't have any time. And we said, are you getting paid for this? She said, no, I help the kids cross the street. <laughs> uh, and, and we said, well, what are you doing the rest of the day? And she says, well, on Thursdays, I take food to the hospital so patients will have some good food to eat. We said, we said, do you have time to volunteer? She says, no, I have no time to volunteer. <laughs> and to her, it wasn't volunteering, it was just neighboring. 
And so I thought if we can get the, everybody to define neighboring like that, we'll have a healthier society. I think we're going to all leave tonight and practice aggressive friendliness. I'm going to find you in the aisles and try it out on you. Um, here's a, a, a hard and serious question. A lot of us who have partners in our life are very afraid of losing them. Sometimes I look over at my husband at night and say, if you don't wake up in the morning, I'm going to be bereft completely without. And I think it's a very common thing. And this question says, what would you suggest for somebody who endures that loss in that immediate yeah. period, how do they become social again? Yeah, um, I do have a chapter in the book sort of on this subject. And the one thing um, to know is that um, grief or some trauma like that, um, the, the problem with it is your brain has to rewire itself. You have a certain model in your head of being with your husband or wife or whatever. And so I was having a friend of mine, lunch with a friend of mine uh, named Andy, and he had just had lost recently lost his wife. Um, and after lunch, we had a great conversation. And he said, oh, "I can't wait to tell." And then he realized there there was no telling. There was no person there to tell. And so you just have to. And the process of grief, C.S. Lewis said, it's like being on a river that repeats itself. It's always changing, but it's repeating itself. And your mind is reformulating itself to the world. And the people who don't recover as much, they try to assimilate what happened into their current worldview. And the people who do recover acclimate what had happened into a new worldview. And so it's a process of reforming your models and realizing that person will forever be a part of the, the love of your life, but will, it's going to be a, a different life. Uh, and I, believe me, I worry about this all the time with my wife dying or me dying and leaving her. Um, it's something that is haunting, and we can't spare ourselves the pain. I think all we can do is um, be present, and that's the, the accompaniment. I'll tell one story that's in the book. Uh, there was a woman who was, I think she was an ethicist, and she was teaching at a, um, in, in a medical school, giving lectures on ethics. And in the middle of one of the years, her husband died of a heart attack while um, skiing, while cross-country skiing. And she told her class, when she returned to the class, I'm scared of, of next year, because in the beginning, of the first session of every class, uh, she asks the students and she presents photos of her private life, just so they'll get to know each other. And so she said, I wasn't sure I would able, I'm gonna be able to get through that class and show, show photos of my late husband. And so the year passes, the summer comes, and the next year, it's time for that class she'd been dreading with the new group of students. And so she walks into the auditorium like this one, and she notices it's oddly full. And the students from the previous year had come. And they were just sitting there. And so it was a, uh, that's just the art of presence. And I, I, I knew a woman named Mary who lost a daughter in Afghanistan. And, uh, then she almost lost another daughter to a bike accident. And she's nursing the, do the other daughter. And she, um, I, we're visiting her. And she says, um, people don't know whether to ask me about Anna, the daughter who died. And they should know, they think they, they don't want to remind me of a bad subject. But they should know that Anna is always on my mind. And you should mention it. And if I feel like talking about her, I will. If I don't know, I'll. So just mention the deceased. Uh, and uh, then she said, you know, you want to know the best thing that's happened to us, the best gift we were given while I'm nursing Catherine back to health? Uh, somebody came and visited us and went to the bathroom and noticed there was no bath mat in the bathroom. And so they went to Target. They got a bath mat. They put it in the bathroom. They never even mentioned this. <laughs> but she said it was just a practical gift that we needed and it, I felt really like that person knew what to do. And so it is weirdly practical gifts that really make a difference to people. That. Love that. Um, this is a, a serious thing that we are facing in our culture right now is almost this uh, Shakespearean um, need for revenge 
that emotion, that, that revenge thing. Can you say something about, does it seem like something that's like a current that's coming into our culture now? Has it always been there? And what do we do? How do we stave off that instinct for revenge? Yeah, I, it's a good question. I haven't thought about that one as much. I will say it's always, it's a bit of a mistake usually to um, think that our generation is uniquely uncivil. I mean, you look, go back to the America's founding and you look at what they were saying about each other. It was brutal. I mean, the, literally the vice president of the United States shot the former treasury secretary and killed him. <laughs> like, that's pretty brutal. Um, but I do think compared to where we were in the 90s, even the 80s, I mean, those seem, as someone who's covered politics, those just seem like innocent times. And we literally have a man running for president who will probably get the Republican nomination. And he's running on a platform, I am your retribution. <laughs> like, that's as revenge-oriented as it's possible to get. Um, and he's, in my view, to get a little political, he's a monster. But um, the people, a lot of the people who supported him, like in 2015, I wrote in like 90 million columns saying, don't worry, Donald Trump will never get the Republican nomination. And so I was living in New York, my social life, I was living in DC, my social life was in New York. I was teaching at Yale. How could I be out of touch with America? Um, uh, uh, and, and, but, so now I spend a lot of time in Trumpy parts of the world, and I've had thousands and thousands of conversations with Trump voters. And a lot of them just feel invisible. Like I go to the, Middle East, the Midwest, and it used to be uh, once a day somebody would say, you, you guys think we're flyover country. Now I hear that 10 times a day. And so they, they feel like insulted by, frankly, coastal elites. And we would call it retribution, like revenge. They would call it like, hey, I'm just standing up for myself. Uh, and so I, I, I don't agree with people who support Trump, but when you get to them to tell you their story, you see where they're coming from. Um, but so I, I do think we have, um, and we should not get um, proud of ourselves for being so broad-minded. When somebody did a study for the Atlantic magazine on what's the most intellectually insular part of the country, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so uh, a little of it is on us. They don't feel seen, and it feels there were a number of questions about this, how to cope with this divided country. And I think we're going to find stuff in the book because it's about they don't feel seen. Yeah, no, we I, don't I, feel seen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, there's, I mean, I find there's epidemic of blindness on all fronts. Black people feel that white people don't understand their daily experience. Rural people not feeling seen by coastal elites. Republicans and Democrats looking at each other in blind incomprehension. And so. The, the way um, around that, as I said, is narrative. Get people out of statement making and get them into storytelling. So I don't ask people, what do you believe? I ask, how'd you come to believe that? And they're telling you about some experience they had, some person who shaped their views. And so, for example, just a quick question, a, a quick little story. I was with some guy in South Dakota who was a super big Trump supporter, and he said, um, let me tell you why. And so he's, he's like 70. And he said, when I was 35, I, I'm going to tell you about the best day of my life. I was a foreman at a plant that made refrigeration units. And they changed the technology. I was no longer qualified. To, so they laid me off. And so I packed up my stuff in a little box in my office. And I thought I would just sneak out. And he opens the door to his office. And 3,600 people, all the employees of the plant, had formed a double line from his office door to his car door in the parking lot. And he walked down it as they applauded him. And he said, that was the best day of my life. And every job I've had since then has been worse and less pay. And so he said, that guy might be a jackass, but I need change. And so I don't agree with him, but OK, I get where you're coming from. And we shouldn't be guilty of a thing called stacking, which is to say, OK, I know one thing about you. You support Donald Trump. And therefore, I'm going to make a whole series of assumptions about you. And stacking is always wrong. I heard recently, well, maybe a few years ago, about a woman who was a big Trump supporter, who was a lesbian biker who converted to Sufi Islam after surviving a plane crash. <laughs> and you're like, what stereotype does she fit into? <laughs> like, so.
<laughs> okay, this is you have to answer the next two questions you're supposed to in like one sentence, maybe two. Religion, more good or more bad in the world? More good. <laughs> I am a religious person, so I'm, I have to say that. How likely this is? If I could just add to that. Oh. The, the religion sometimes leads to war not because of the religion, but because they lead to groups. And groups fight wars. Okay, how, another you know, quick answer. How likely a ceasefire in Gaza? Um, well, eventually. You guys uh, are the brutal ones saying it needed to be quick yeah. answer. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the war will end. Um, uh, and will Israel uh, defeat Hamas? Yes, in some way, but I have trouble believing it'll be the total defeat they're dreaming of right now. But, you know, to be where I stand on this, I stand, I thought, if anybody saw Hillary Clinton on The View, she pretty much expresses what I think that we've, we had ceasefire after ceasefire after ceasefire with Hamas. And every time Hamas would reload and then break the ceasefire. And to me, at some point, it became evident, like to Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden, frankly, that the ceasefire policy was just not worth it. And so it, I think in the long run, it'll lead to less bloodshed, but I, you know, well, you, you were, I haven't been to the Middle East in a while, I, I used to cover it. And I, one thing I learned covering it is that if you're away for uh, six months, you don't really know what you're talking about. It changes so much, so I, I try to be a little humble about that. This person wants you to know you have a strong fan base in Guam. Guam. I did not know, so thank I, you that was for. Um, what do you do every day, if it's one thing or two things that keep you optimistic? Hmm. Um, you know, I, I guess, well, the thing I do every day is write. <laughs> uh, I wake up every morning and at 7, I write till n noon or, or 1 p.m. Every morning, seven days a week, probably 350 days a year. When we were married, my wife thought, we're going to have these nice leisurely breakfasts. We'll talk about things. But I really don't talk to human beings until I've written a thousand words. So um, when I, I used to wear a Fitbit, and my Fitbit would say I was napping. But I think it's, um, so I just need to do it. That keeps me optimistic. Um, hanging around the weavers, you know, while the, while the world was in despair over Donald Trump, I was meeting the most inspiring people on the face of the earth. And we would go into any town, and we would just say, who's trusted here? And people would point to what, they would give us names, and often they were the same names. And these are people who are serving the homeless, feeding the poor, cleaning up empty lots. Uh, there was a guy named Pancho Aguilas in Houston who he takes men who've been um, paralyzed in construction accidents, gives them diapers and, and catheters and wheelchairs so they can be dignified. And then they all train in social work. And so you'll be in a neighborhood in Houston and 25 Hispanic guys in wheelchairs will come in your neighborhood and help you with your neighborhood. And Pancho was just like this beautiful human being. And I said to him once, you know, you just radiate holiness. And he said, no, I reflect holiness. Good answer. And so those people, and they're, they're here, I'm sure they're here. And so those people keep you uplifted. I'm sure there is a Dr. Seuss size of books on your bedside table. What types of books are always to be found there? on my bedside table. There are some books that are good enough to read, not good, uh, good enough to buy, but not good enough to read. Um, so the, some of them stay there. Um, there's a couple of books I'm reading. Um, I mean, right now, I'm, I'm, my next book, I think, will be on the idea of merit, merit. And I don't know quite what it is, but I think like the history of the meritocracy is a history of different definitions of what merit is. And we now have a system of merit which is highly IQ-based, Schools, a lot of schools sort of measure people by that. I think it's a shallow way to measure human beings by what their IQ is, or frankly, how good they are at pleasing teachers between the ages of 15 and 25. <laughs> um, and so, and then I think AI is going to redefine how we think of intelligence. And so that seems to be a change. So I'm reading a lot of books on 
intelligence and the meritocracy and stuff like that. So uh, there's a great Wallace Stegner book I really recommend called Crossing to Safety. Oh. Yeah. And in that book, there's a lifelong friendship between a, a literature professor and a writer. And the writer says to him at one point, you read to appreciate, I read to steal. <laughs> so I'm a little like that. I'm reading books that, what can I learn here? What, how, what can I use here? <laughs> okay, we're down to the two last questions. Um, and I think they're important ones because of the book. It's like, who is a person in your life you regret most not fully seeing? Oh, that's a very good question. I would say, um, I don't know if I'll, I guess I'll tell a personal story. Um, so I mentioned I was raised by my grandfather. And in our family, the words, I love you, were never said. And so when I was 20 or so, uh, he was in the hospital room, and I went to visit him. And uh, he, he said, I'm a dead duck, I'm dying here. And I was leaving after that visit, I remember the room was super hot, uh, and he said, I love you. And I did not say it back. And I remember that moment. It was a very bad moment for me. And so I, that's one uh, person I regret not seeing or at least expressing my care. Who in your life do you wish could have seen you more fully? Hmm. I, I guess, um, I, I, frankly, I think a lot of my readers, frankly, um, I, I mean, I don't know if you've ever read the comment section of the, the New York Times. Uh, uh, so people just, first of all, they, they get a label in your head, uh, conservative. And so people make all sorts of assumptions about me because of that label. Now, I am an Edmund Burke-style conservative. I believe in certain philosophical ideas. But I haven't voted for Republicans since 2004. And so, like, I'm, I, <laughs> um, and I certainly under Trump, I'm, whatever conservatism is in America, that's not me. And yet, for some people, the idea that um, uh, I'm different from Tucker Carlson or Ann Coulter, that's not, a, uh, that's not an idea they have, can grapple with. So sometimes I feel labeled. And then, frankly, now I'm really venting. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for this therapy session. Um, so I'm bookish and I read a lot of books. And so people assume that I'm very staid and like just an old guy. <laughs> um, and when I discovered my emotions, I learned that I have a heart of a, of a 14 year old girl. Whatever, 14 -year -old, whatever music 14 year old girls are listening to, that's what I'm listening to. <laughs> so Katy Perry or Kesha or um, Billie Eilish now. And I can barely remember high school, but I know every Taylor Swift breakup song by heart. <laughs> well, we are at the end of the, I have to say, one, I feel you uh, stepping closer to us lately, those of us on the left, and, and so whatever's happening in New York Times, uh, reviews on that. But I wanna say, I think you are not going to leave this world um, not having lived it fully. It's just That's that so way about good. you. And I think that this book is a, a gift to us to go forward and, and adopt some of that. You're probably already doing a lot of it, but I think there's a lot in that. This was magnificent tonight, okay. really. I really Thank appreciate you, David it. Brooks. <laughs>